Started. We're live. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Joseph G. Bella, and I'm vice president of the uh, vice president of the Historical Society. And right now, we're located at the society headquarters. And as of September of 2019, we are now the um, Museum of Methuen History. And we're uh, filming here on, on location as part of the Trails and Sales events, and um, we're going to be highlighting the life and times of uh, Methuen born Major Robert Rogers uh, of Methuen. And uh, I'm going to mention briefly his birth um, and his, uh, the family's move to Ben uh, New Hampshire, and then Tom Spillary will cover the rest of the uh, history of uh, Major Robert Rogers. You ready? Uh, here is Tom Spillary. All right, before we get started, though, I want to thank everybody for coming out for this Trails and Sales event. Like most of the events right now, we're having major issues with uh, the technology. Um, it dropped on the Methuen page. We're hoping to get that back. We're still going to run it on my page. And I tried running it on a third page and it locked me out. So technology isn't going well. But Trails and Sales was formed years ago to give a chance to get everybody to look at their own backyard. What is in here in the Essex National Heritage Area? So with these big events going on, and they go right through the weekend. So check out trailsandsales.org. There's over 200 free events in a week and a half. We're about a third of the way through. When there's events tomorrow, tonight, and all the way through Sunday night. So check them out. So this year we're going virtual, as you can see, we're having all sorts of virtual issues. And with that, I want to reintroduce Joe, who's going to talk about Rogers in the film. There you go, Joe. Okay, very good. <clears throat> I'll go this way this time. Major Robert Rogers was born in Methuen on November 7, 1731, the son of James and Mary Rogers. And um, seven days later, November 14, 1731, he was baptized at the First Church Congregational by its first minister, um, Reverend Christopher Sargent, uh, who, by the way, is, is buried at Meeting House Hill Cemetery here in Methuen. The birthplace place was located at the corner of Cross and Hampshire Road, about 44 acres of land, and the house was probably located on the western slope of the hill located there on uh, Cross Street. Um, the property uh, itself um, was it listed in an unrecorded deed, and it was land sold to Robert Rogers' father, James Rogers, by Robert Swan. And um, let's see. The late Methuen City historian, Ernest G. Mack, spent three, over three years to locate the birthplace of Robert Rogers. The uh, book, Northwest Passage, as we all know, was written by Kenneth Roberts, who visited Methuen um, before the uh, location of Rogers' birth site. And he couldn't find where Robert Rogers was born as he was writing Northwest Passions. So moving ahead, uh, again, a city historian, the late Ernest G. Mack, located Rod Robert Rogers' birthplace. And we have to thank Ernest's mother, Eva Kelly Upham. She taught Ernest years earlier how to conduct thorough and accurate deed research. And it really paid off. Um, when uh, Ernest had to uh, search for Mr. Uh, Robert Rogers' birthplace. And again, over three years it took for uh, him to uh, locate the actual site. And if the land was a, a small 
area of a high spot. And Ernest assumed the, the cabin, uh, whatever the structure was, would have been there because of its uh, somewhat higher uh, height than around the area. Um, there was a marker installed and uh, during the 1980s, and unfortunately, the sign was vandalized. Um, hopefully, there will be another sign to replace the original sign uh, that was there beforehand. Um, around the age of 12, uh, the Rogers family moved to Dutton Bond, New Hampshire. And you can see the cellar hole on the Rogers, named Rogers Road in Dunbarton, uh, near the cemetery where his brother is buried. And um, now we're going to have Tom Spillary speak on the uh, Rob Major Robert Rogers' later uh, events and life. All right. I want to apologize. We're having so many technical difficulties that we're not going to be able to show this the way I wanted to show it. But I want to thank LCAT for coming in. So if you want to check their YouTube video, great. Um, so we got the we got up the Dunbarton, and we know where um, the cellar hole was located at the uh, near the where the cemetery where his brother's buried. So. In 1794, Rogers sees active duty in King George's War. At the age of 15, uh, Concord attacked, uh, served as private in Captain Daniel Ladd's scouting camp, July 16th to October 2nd, 1746. He got at the frontier of New Hampshire. On August 1st to, 17, uh, to September 12th, 1747, he was with Captain Ebenezer Eastman, who was actually buried in Haverhill. Uh, the Eastman started in Haverhill. So this is during King George's War, which was 1794 all the way to uh, 17, 1744 to 1798. So... Um, then in 1745, Rogers Farm in Dunbarton was destroyed by St. Francis Indians. Only the apple tree survived. 1752, Rogers' father was killed by his best friend in a hunting accident. Um, Robert was 21. The best friend who killed him in a hunting accident, um, you, you might have heard of his name before, I'm not 100% sure. But he had this quote called, live free or die. So, um, it's the gentleman who did that. Uh, so, and then in 1753, he built his home and barn in Dunbot, New Hampshire again, and was trapping, trading all the way uh, to Canada. So Rogers spent a lot of time trapping, trading in Canada. In 1753, scouting under Captain Goff, by the way, which Goff's town was named after, G-O-F-F. -F. In 1754, August 23rd to September 21, Rogers serves as a private in Blanchard's detachment of the New Hampshire Regiment posted on the Upper Connecticut River Valley, about where Havel, New Hampshire stands today. Uh, in 1755, now we get into the French Indian War, 1755 to 1763. January, he raises 24 men um, for Nova Scotia service in Shirley Mass's regiment. So from Shirley, they went up, we're going up to Nova Scotia. 1755, he was arrested on suspicion of counterfeiting and printing phony money. And that starts Rogers' life. It, so by February 12th, uh, 1755, uh, cleans himself up by breaking his contract with Mass and taking himself and 24 men into New Hampshire for service. In, 17, in April of 1755, he's commissioned by captain of the 1st Company of Blanchard's New Hampshire Reg Regiment designated as a ranger camp. 
Rogers Rangers is born. It, that was their first green uniforms. Uh, as you can see here. Seventeen fifty five he fought in the Battle of Bloody Pawn. This was the first battle he was in with his own men. Now for tonight's purposes, tonight was the life and times of Major Robert Rogers. We're going through his life and times, but um, the next event that we do have um, with Rogers, I'm going to go in depth about his his first battle, because that bloody on battle made Rogers who he was and helped him build and cement his legacy. June 1755 builds Fort Wentworth at the forks off of the Connecticut and the upper Amistook River in Coas County, New Hampshire. August 20th, his camp, uh, his camp is detached from the New Hampshire Regiment to join Johnson at Lake George and add to his scouting um, army. So, Lake George, as everyone can see, is right here, here's Champlain and Lake George. Um, as you can see, um, this is pretty much what won the current, uh, the conquest of the French Indian War, and you can see the map of Lake George here, and all the forts along Lake George. Hello, Walter. All right. Oops. I'm jumping ahead. I don't want to do that. Okay. Uh, 1755 to 1761. He fought in 27 battles and caused the French many problems. He continued to hone his skills between battles, turning his men in uh, and teaching them the Native American style of warfare. Now I'm going to go back before I continue to shoot these dates. Remember Joe said Robert was born in Methuen. He was. He was born on the Havel Drake and Path, which was also a major Native American route from Havel to Drake. It. Um, and it started at the old Drake and Town, in Methu uh, Havel Town Hall, and came up the back way in, up around the Rogers, off a cross street, and then ends up in Drake, it, Massachusetts. He was he was taught by Native Americans their style of fighting, so. All these early raids that he started in the Battle of Bloody Pond and the rest of them, when you, during the French Indian War in this time period, the British would line up thousands of men or hundreds of men and they would fight. And that's how they fought. Rogers taught his men how to shoot from behind stone walls, trees, um, and I'm going to get into the major battle that defined Rogers' career. There were two battles, one we're going to discuss tonight and one I'm going to hold off because um, I'm still working on a couple things on that. So in 1756, he commanded a, a uh, commission to form an independent camp of rangers. So what happened between the time he was arrested for making money, uh, the queen knew he could fight. So she sent somebody down to the jail and said, we're going to commission you as leader of your own ranger corps, and you're going to train your men, or do you want to stay in jail? Well, no one wants to stay in jail, so he left. So they commissioned the rangers and um, the new ranger corps, independent camper rangers. These men were most fearless, aggressive group you could find. Um, they were hunters, trappers, thieves. They were not your British regulars. They were not the prim and proper soldier. These guys were not, these guys were backwoodsmen, basically. So he puts them together. As an independent um, camp, he, un he un under British military jurisdiction, um, he had a code of conduct for his men. Ah, the code of conduct. Oh, fell 
that's a standing order. Which was is also standing orders. Um, all right, I'm going to get into that. So is code of conduct a standing orders? I'm going to go over a few of these because they're quite interesting. Again, that's the uniform they were using. So his first on the code of conduct: don't forget nothing. Very important. Have your musket clean as a whistle. Hatchet scoured. 60 rounds of powder and ball, be ready to march in a minute's warning. When, uh, when you're on a march, act the way you would, as if you were sneaking up on a deer, see the enemy first. Tell the truth about what you see and what you do. This is an army depending on us for correct information. You can lie to all you please, when you tell the other folk about the rangers, but never lie to a ranger or an officer. Hmm. Don't never take a chance you don't have to. When you're on march, we march single file, far enough apart, so if someone is shot, they cannot go through two men. That would work today with six feet social distancing. Yeah. Uh, that was That's a good one. Don't, um, if, we, if we strike swamps or soft ground, we spread out abreast, so it's hard to track us. When we march, we keep moving till dark, so as to give the enemy the least possible chance to hit us. When we camp, half the party stays awake while the other half sleeps. If we take prisoners, we keep them separate till we had time to examine them, so they can't cook up a story between them. Don't ever march home the same way, and we'll get into that in a few minutes. Take a different route that you would, so you wouldn't get ambushed. No matter the weather, we travel in big parties or little ones. Each party has to keep a scout 20 yards ahead and 20 yards on each flank and 20 yards in the rear, so the main body cannot be surprised and wiped out. Every night you'll be told where to meet if surrounded by superior force. Don't sit down and eat without posting sentries. Don't sleep beyond dawn. Dawn is when the French and Indians attack. Don't cross a river by a regular ford. Create your own. And he did do that. If someone's trailing you, make a circle, come back onto your own tracks and ambush the folks that aim to ambush you. Don't stand up when the enemy's coming against you. Kneel down, lie down, and hide behind a tree. Let your enemy come till almost close enough to touch, then let him have it and jump out and finish him with your hatchets. So that's how you save ammunition. In 1759, the St. Patrick's Day Battle and Massacre at Fort William and Henry, Rogers ambushed, Rogers and his men were ambushed, suffered major losses. Rogers was injured. Um, temporary relinquished command of his rangers and, uh, led, and led his men to safety and held off the attackers and escaped at night back towards Fort William, back towards the fort. Um, in March 1758, the Battle of Snowshoes, Rogers Rock, New York. Heavy snow had fallen, um, filling with bitter cold. Um, heavy casualties on both sides of the British and the French. Rogers pulled his men back up the hill and waited till dark. He ordered his men to put their snowshoes on backwards and literally walk out the next morning. The native warriors in the morning took the hill, and when they got up to the top of the hill, they saw the tracks going, walking like they were um, walking up the hill. So they thought they had them up the hill. But remember, Rogers ordered his men to put those snowshoes on backwards. Next morning, the natives and the French took the hill, and when 
they reached the top of the hill, they could see Rogers and his men below, and the natives refused uh, being protected uh, by a spirit guide. They refused to attack the men, because they felt now, that's when Rogers in Native American terms became known as Wampa Lampa, Wampa Pampa Wamp. It's about 36 words, meaning white devil. 36 letters, sorry, meaning white devil. So, um, and that was the Battle of Rogers Rock. He really, that was another major milestone in Robert Rogers' illustrious military career. By July 1758, the failed attack on Fort Ticonderoga. July 1759, a year later, French and Indian allies lost Ticonderoga. September 13, 1759. Um, okay, so on September 13, 1759 was the beginning of the end for the French Indian War. It was the most important date. If any date you take out of tonight, the most important date would be 1759, September 13th. General Abercrombie is given the realm to go up to Quebec, to the Plains of Abraham, on that same day, September 13th, 1759, Rogers Rangers is asked to go up to St. Francis and take the village up, wipe the village up. Because St. Francis was the raiding party that attacked everywhere. Every Native American attack came out of the St. Francis area. So they figured if they could take out one, they'd have a good chance of ending this battle. Right? So, so there was only, so they thought St. Francis was going to be an impossible attack. So they said, well, we'll send um, Major Robert Rogers up there with his men, because they have been known to pull off the impossible. Now, what do I mean by the impossible? Um, they went um, pretty much all the way to Canada. Now, how did they get there? In a book no outlined Northwest Passage, you can see some of the stuff that went on up there. They made their own boats. They forged their own rivers, crossing some very tough waters. So on September 13, 1759, 200 men left Crown Point under the direction of Major Robert Rogers, including John McCarty, who was a local guy, and many, many others. The mission was to destroy St. Francis Village, home of the Abenaki, also called Odenak, located on the St. Lawrence River in New France. So the St. Lawrence River in New France is all the way up here. So they're going. They got a ways to go. He and his 200 men don't press, what, it went off? Oh. Him and his 200, okay. So him and 200 men left Crown Point on the evening of September 13, 1759. He went down Lake Champlain to Misakoit Bay. Everything was going according to plan until the fifth day when a keg of gunpowder exploded, wounding Captain Williams. Now when you're on a march like that, you have wounded soldiers, it's, yeah, you got to send them home. So Captain Williams was sent back with some men. Reduced to 140, they forged on. By September 20th, they arrived at Misakoi Bay without detention. He left a few trusted natives to hide and watch the boats and supplies. They actually went up over mountaintops with these boats. They carried them through the woods. And we're not talking about light canoes. We're talking about dugout canoes. They weighed hundreds and hundreds of pounds. So, um, all right, a few days later, the natives caught up with Rogers and told them that the boats and supplies were discovered. Rogers sent 
Levy, uh, Lieutenant Levy McMillan with 10 men to Crown Point so he could have food and supplies sent to Charlestown at Fort Number 4. Now I've been out to the location of Fort Number 4. Um, it's located right on Route 10 in Charlestown. There is a museum, a newer museum built to look like the old Fort Number 4, but not in the same location. We haven't been there yet. By the 10th day, the, the Rangers were only 15 miles south of St. Francis. They forged on the St. Francis River, making a human chain to cross the St. Francis River. By 8 p.m. on September 23, 1759, Major Rogers, um, Lieutenant Levy Turner, and Sonny Avery, um, what? That one we gotta run. Just zoom in on this stuff for a minute, Daniel. I am. Let me talk about the museum a little bit. Yeah, could you? Yeah. Just tell them we're expecting technical difficulties. Okay, okay everyone, we have a little oh, bit of ended. technical difficulties, but I want to, uh, before I forget, to invite everyone to the uh, um, Thune Museum history, of History location, the old uh, Tenney Gatehouse, the former Tenney Gatehouse. We just reopened on September 12th. And um, to check on our schedule opening, which, by the way, is, is no admission charge, go to www.methuenhistoricalsociety.org. Again, www.methuenhistoricalsociety.org. And you'll be able to check on our schedule and the opening uh, dates. Um, as an FYI, we're open Saturdays and Wednesdays. But again, check our website to get the um, actual dates. Um, and again, we did open finally on September 12th. Um, we were closed for 90 days, three, three months, I think. We were closed, close to three or four months. Uh, we have a lot of exhibits here at the uh, museum. And um, of course, we cover the three millionaires, Searles, Tenney, and Nevins. And we also have a Whittier room um, highlighting the actual builder of the, uh, what was known for years as the Tenney Gatehouse. Uh, Mr. Whittier built the building uh, in 1830 and was known as the Whittier Farm uh, for quite a few years here in, in town. And again, we have um, a lot of uh, items um, doing history, quite a few items to see. Um, so check again, to remind you, check our website and uh, hope to hear, uh, hope to see you. you come in to uh, visit us. The museum, the Methuen Museum of History. On the 39 Pleasant Street, Methuen, Mass. And that's about it. Keep talking, Joe. I gotta get this back on. Yes. Right. Oh, Northwest Passage. Kenneth Roberts was a, quite a proficient writer. Um, besides Northwest Passage, he also wrote Arundel, uh, Rebel to Arms, Oliver Wiswell, but I think he considered Northwest Passage one of his best uh, stories. Again, he, he, as I mentioned earlier, he came to Methuen um, while writing the story, Northwest Passage, and really was disappointed he couldn't find Robert Rogers' exact birth's place. Uh, and for years, some people thought Rogers was born in New Hampshire. But it, as it turns out, uh, Mr. the late Ernest G. Mack proved them wrong. And he definitely was a, uh, a 
a citizen of fairly town Methuen. Um, Kenneth Roberts, again, uh, his story uh, was quite popular uh, when, it, when the book did come out, so much so that Hollywood saw what he had written and decided to make a movie in 1939 starring Spencer Tracy, Robert Young, Ruth Hussey, and Walter Brennan, who happens to be a Gloucester resident, um, local boy <coughs> from uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts. The movie was very, very successful. And again, it, it highlighted our major Robert Rogers, as, uh, as Hollywood movies tended to do in, in that day. <coughs> that was sort of the golden age of Hollywood as well, uh, the 1930s up to the 1940s. Uh, so again, the movie was very successful. I think it put uh, Spencer Tracy's name on the map, so to speak. And uh, very, very good coverage, <coughs> very good uh, bio by uh, Robert Rogers. <coughs> my poster from my collection, one of the items, and another, a uh, couple of small posters brought here. Northwest Passage, that one there. <coughs> and this one here, Northwest Passage. Oh. Also in my collection, I brought a book published in London in 1761. The only thing new about this book, of course, is the cover. The Insides, again, was published in 1761 in London, and it's Roger's first book, A Concise Account of North America, written by Major Robert Rogers, printed in London, printed for the author in uh, 1761. And it's quite an account about North America, in the 1750s and 60s, and again written by Major Robert Rogers, the entire book, except for the cover. That's new. And I purchased this in an antique shop in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And coincidentally, I was attending a Tenney High School, class of 63, high school reunion, and the hotel was the Hotel Marriott that we were staying in. And I took a walk outside the hotel one day, walked into the antique shop, saw the book, and it said, you must buy me, and, uh, Robert Rogers. And I purchased it, and I'm glad I did. And again, it's Rogers' first book. He had written a couple, I think The Life of Pontiac. And that was more like a play. It was sort of a play. In fact, it might have been, uh, it would be the first play ever written by someone from the United States, uh, American colonies actually, the American colonies, colonies before the United States. And so Mr. Rogers was a pretty good writer as well as uh, you know, the leader of Rogers Rangers. All right, we're gonna finish this. Okay. I'll figure out what we're gonna do later on. I'll get it out somehow this week. All right. Sorry about that. We we have a we had to do this virtual, and for some reason it's just not working. Um, okay. So at 4:30 a.m., the Rangers surrounded St. Francis and attacked, killing everyone in sight. Um, that was and the same uh, Indians that tried to flee. The natives that tried to fl flee, but they were escaping. Rogers um, reported the incident, uh, 200 Abenaki uh, warriors were killed. And Captain Organ, uh, Organ was wounded, six privates were wounded, one native scout dead. The raid was over by 7 a.m. They feared some hostages in the um, they freed some of the hosti hostages, released for an hour, and then started their, uh, for home. Eight days they stayed together, but food was running low, 
and some of the rangers took loot instead of food, this would actually cause them hardship and death on the way back. On the ninth day, he broke his, his men up into smaller groups and then happened, um, this happened on the north side of Lake Menopause. Two days later, Ensign Avery's group was overtaken by seven natives, um, seven of them captured and two escaped. Uh, another party, uh, Levy Dunbar and Levy Turner were ambushed and most killed, including Dunbar. Turner was captured and later released. Roger's group, on the other hand, continued their course, but it was a tough one. There was no game to hunt due to the very uh, cold temperatures, but as strong leadership kept his new moving, his ranger corps skirted the eastern shores of Lake Menopog, passing through what he described as the chestnut land um, colony, way crossing um, several rivers. He continued in a south Wood man in direction, hugging the east side of Lake Wallaby beneath Mount Pescara, now located at the western branch of the As Asumic River, uh, and continued down the river to its junction of the, uh, and continued down for another 10 miles till they meet to the north of the rendezvous point. Afraid that the natives might capture them, still they moved out in a westerly uh, manner. A longer route, but it would be harder to detect them because the natives used that waterway uh, um, as part of their ways of moving around that area up that way. Um, He also avoided the modern day uh, Route 5, and this area was known as a high ambush area. Uh, Rogers and his men were about 50 miles west of Pesumski River. He continued to march his men to the Wells River. He continued to follow the Wells River, uh, then swung southeast along the north side of the Wichita Mountain. From there, he traced the Wells River to the junction with the Amistook and the Connecticut near modern day Woodsville, New Hampshire, better known as Havel, New Hampshire area. When supplies were supposed to be October 20th, 1759. Lieutenant Samuel Stevens hearing guns um, and left the um, left to alert Rogers and his men and the, the food supplies, um, they could have been uh, deadly if a few rangers had gotten there a little earlier because there was a trap laid. He built a raft and put Captain Ogden on the raft with him and flowed down the Connecticut River and they almost went over the White River Falls, they could have drowned. But they continued to head down the river to the Ottaquichi Falls and slowly using a rope got into the makeshift rafts, raft over the falls and floated down river. He saw some men cutting trees along the river. He helped they helped Rogers and got them food and got them off the fort num to reach Fort Number no. Four, October 31st, 1759. And like he promised, on the tenth day he returned to, uh, to his men. By November 7th, 1759, everyone was back at Fort Number no. Four. From time, uh, from the time his men left St. Francis, September 14th, 1759, till they reached Fort Number no. Four, November 7th. 1759, Rogers lost three lieutenants, 
46 sergeants and privates. A few returned later because they were prisoners, but most had died. After the St. Francis raid, Rogers went through the ups and downs. He had gotten into trouble again with British officers. He had trouble with, um, he had a little problem with rum and hot water. It's a great drink in the wintertime. Clears the throat. Uh, and no one ever trusted him again, not even Washington. He returned to England in 1777 and died in 1795. He may be buried in a pauper's grave, but some say he could be buried somewhere in New England. Even though Rogers, um, let me just explain the somewhere in New England. Um, There's a story that he, his body was dug up in England, brought back to Vermont, and buried where his brother is out in Vermont. There's another story, and not too far from here, just outside of Portsmouth, a little graveyard, and there's a stone sitting on his ex-wife's family plot that says, M. Robert Rogers. And that is it. So we don't know where he's buried. Even though Rogers um, faded out of glory by the end of his life, his legacy lives on. The destruction of St. Francis turned the tide in British favor, and we at the time over um, war. His standing orders, which I read, are still used today, and... Um, he also re he's also been credited with reinventing the way battles were fought by using guerrilla warfare tactics that only natives would have used in fighting. So when you leave, when you hear someone talk about the great war heroes, please let them know that not all warriors are fully explained in history classes or in schools across America. Remember Robert Rogers. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I know we had a lot of problems today, but um, thank LCAT for sticking this one out because there were problems galore with the technology. And we'll see you again real soon. Thank you very much for tuning in.